I'm Doc Manson, and this is Horrid. Today's episode, Dawn of Horror. As a child, I spent entirely too much time inside on Saturday and Sunday afternoons. I was always watching television edits of films that honestly had no business being aired by the local network affiliates during the weekend matinee time slot. I was six years old, sitting in an uncomfortable wooden chair in front of the 10 inch television in our kitchen. I remember watching in utter horror as the body of a bloodied teenaged girl, wrapped in plastic, was dragged down the school hall by an unseen presence in Wes Craven's 1984 slasher classic, A Nightmare on Elm Street. I have memories throughout my childhood of closing my eyes and seeing that crimson red streak that Tina leaves on the floor of the hallway. I was terrified. And I was hooked. What is it that fans find so alluring about horror? It's a question that any genre fan has encountered countless times throughout their lives. A lot of people just don't understand the appeal, and after a lifetime of trying to explain it, I've come to accept that there simply isn't an explanation that will satisfy everyone. After all, how do you explain the enjoyment that comes from being scared. Two basic emotions that seem the complete antithesis of the other. The rush of adrenaline, that increased heart rate. The acidic knot that just sits, heavy, in the pit of your stomach. You either get it, or you don't. You're either one of us, or you're not. I don't mean for that statement to come across as gatekeeping. It's important to be inclusive, especially with a hobby as potentially misunderstood as horror films. While it was my experience that I came to find the enjoyment of the horror genre at a young age, it is just as valid to develop an appreciation for these films later in life. I don't care if you've seen 10 horror movies or a thousand. Maybe you're still trying to work up the nerve to watch your first. It, it doesn't matter. I hope that Horrid can grow and become a community for everyone. While I consider myself relatively well-versed in horror, I am aware of some personal blind spots. The first that comes to mind is Giallo. These are murder mystery films of Italian origin and which served as the precursors to the slasher film craze of the 70s and 80s. While I'm certain I will eventually talk about Jalo on later episodes of Horrid, it was through this type of self-reflection that I realized I didn't have a strong grasp on the origins of the horror genre itself. I knew immediately the first questions that I wanted to answer as a part of Horrid. How did the horror genre begin, and what was the very first horror film? While the Universal Monster films are some of the most popular and enduring classics of the genre, I knew that the horror genre must have existed beforehand. I was aware of the silent vampire film Nosferatu, which had been released in Germany in 1922. What about before that? Well, I had heard the title, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, although I honestly had never seen it. And what about before that? Honestly, that was about the limit of my pre-existing knowledge of the genre. As much as I'd like to believe that horror cinema simply sprang into existence fully formed, <laughs> like some sort of quickly gestating xenomorph chestburster, I knew that there had to be more to the story. I started with a quick online search for the term earliest horror film, which pretty much immediately brought my attention to the French illusionist and early film pioneer Georges Méliès. There are numerous sources online which name Méliès as the director of the very first horror film. If the name sounds familiar, you may recognize Méliès as the subject of the 2011 Martin Scorsese film, Hugo. Scorsese's movie is probably best described as a love letter to the early days of cinema, and its plot is based upon a fictional account of the latter parts of Méliès' life. Georges Méliès was born on December 8th, 
1861 in Paris. He was the youngest of three brothers, and his father was a successful shoemaker who eventually opened a high-end boot factory. As a child, Meliers often found himself at odds with his teachers. They would yell at him for doodling in his notebooks when he should have been paying attention to class. As he grew older, Meliers' artistic side became more pronounced. Still a child, he began building puppet theaters out of cardboard, and it wasn't long before a teenage Meliers was building his own sophisticated marionettes. It was clear from a young age that Meliers was both creatively and technically minded. After graduating from high school, Meliers' parents sent him to London, where he apprenticed as a clerk at the business of a family friend for a handful of years. It was during this time in England that Meliers was first exposed to and became fascinated with the art of stage magic, often attending shows at the Egyptian Hall. After returning to Paris in 1885, Meliers attempted to embrace his inner artist. He made it known to his family that he wished to study painting, but his father refused to support his artistic endeavors. With few other options, Meliers put his technically inclined mind to work as a machinery supervisor at the family's boot factory. Over the next several years, his love for magic continued to flourish, and he would often attend local magic shows at the theater Robert Houdin. It was around this time that Meliers began learning the craft of stage magic for himself. Meliers continued to work in the family boot factory until his father retired in 1888. Shortly thereafter, Meliers sold his stake in the family business and used this money to fund the purchase of the Theatre Robert Houdin. Meliers did find some success as a stage illusionist. He was a talented performer, and he was able to apply his technically inclined mind to invent a series of new illusions that kept his audiences entertained. So, I'm sure many of you have begun to wonder, what does a French stage magician from well over 100 years ago have to do with the origins of horror in cinema? I assure you, we're starting to get there. In December of 1895, Meliers attended a private presentation hosted by the Lumiere brothers. The event was a showcase for the brothers' latest invention, the cinematograph. Although there are a few earlier examples of functional motion picture technology, the cinematograph is probably the most important of these, as it is essentially the ancestral analog of the modern motion film camera. In fact, the Lumiere's machine was actually more than a camera. It was an all-in-one solution for making motion pictures. The device could not only record images to film, but it had a separate compartment for developing footage. If that weren't enough, the cinematograph could also be operated in reverse and used as a projector to display the films that it captured and developed. Again, it really was a beautiful all-in-one solution. The cinematograph was a technological marvel and Meliers immediately recognized its potential as a device for entertainment. He offered the Lumieres 10,000 francs for one of the machines, an offer which was refused as the brothers were more focused on the scientific merits of the invention. Meliers was so intrigued by the motion picture technology, however, that he set forth to find an alternative. Not long after, he purchased an animatograph from Robert W. Paul, an inventor from England. The animatograph wasn't a camera like the cinematograph, Really, it was just a projection system. With it, Meliers immediately began showing motion pictures at his theater, and before long, he had figured out how to reverse engineer the animatograph to function as a camera. And just like that, history was made. Meliers began making his own films in May of 1896. The Star Film Company was established as Meliers' production company, and he produced over 80 films during the remaining seven months of 1896. Over the course of his career as a filmmaker, which would stretch from 1896 to 1913, Meliers would remain equally as productive, ultimately directing over 500 films. In 1896, the medium of film was in its absolute infancy. Films from this era are significantly different from what we recognize as movies today. For example... All of the scenes in these early movies are static shots, lacking any sort of camera movement. This is mostly a physical limitation related to the size of these early camera systems. A second and perhaps more obvious difference is that these early films are silent as the advent of synchronized audio is still decades away. Although movies were sometimes presented to audiences alongside a musical accompaniment, there are no attempts at dialogue. These earliest films don't even make use of the dialogue cue cards that would appear in later silent films. 
And finally, the run times of early films are measured in seconds, or at most, minutes. Combined with the static camera work and the lack of dialogue, these films tend to be devoid of complex narrative. At first, the very idea of watching motion pictures was enough of an appeal that audience came out in droves to see recordings of everyday events. Some of the earliest films, those produced by the Lumiere brothers in 1895 and 1896, depict common events like a train arriving at a station and workers exiting the Lumiere factory as they go on break. Once this initial awe was sufficiently satiated, the door was opened for the film medium to progress in new directions. This is where creative minds, like that of Georges Méliès, began to come into play. As I said earlier, my search for the term earliest horror film brought up several sources which name Méliès as the father of horror in film. All of these claims seem to be based on Méliès being the director of the 1896 film Le Manoir du Diable, which roughly translates to The Manor, or more commonly, The House of the Devil. It is this film, directed by Méliès, which is commonly credited as being the very first horror film. In the film, which has a runtime just over three minutes, a large bat is seen flying around a room. In an instant, the bat transforms into a caped man, a transformation not unlike something you would expect to see in a vampire movie. Based on the title of the film, one presumes that this caped man is an incarnation of a devil or demon. For our first bit of trivia, the devil is played by Georges Méliès himself. As the film continues, the devil paces the room before conjuring up a large cauldron from out of thin air. He then proceeds to conjure an impish helper who works the cauldron, ultimately producing a woman from the cauldron who then retreats into one of the back rooms. The devil disappears as two well-dressed men enter the castle room. The imp reappears and antagonizes the two men using a pitchfork, causing one to run off in fear. The other man investigates and is surprised by a suddenly appearing skeleton, a sequence which probably qualifies as the first jump scare in movie history. The bat reappears and again transforms into the devil, who summons the imp to continue terrorizing the man. Finally, the man tries to run out of the castle, but is intercepted by a group of white-robed ghosts, causing the man to faint from fear. The man comes to and is confronted by the woman that was conjured earlier in the film. He tries to greet the woman, but she transforms into the group of ghosts. The man's friend returns and a quick Scooby-Doo style chase occurs before the friend again runs off. The man seems to realize that the ghosts can't harm him and he is puzzled by their ability to disappear at will. As the film draws to a close, the man is again confronted by the devil. Thinking quickly, the man removes a cross from the wall and uses it to repel the mischievous demon before we fade to black. As mentioned, there isn't a strong narrative at work in The House of the Devil. However, a basic story can be pieced together from the actions presented on screen. We may never know why the men enter into the castle or what exactly the devil wishes to accomplish, but these narrative hooks were not the point of Melier's early works. Instead, he utilized his know-how as an illusionist to create moving pictures depicting the sorts of actions that would otherwise be impossible to show an audience at the turn of the 20th century. For a long time, The House of the Devil was presumed lost, as many of the early motion pictures were destroyed during World War I. In 1917, the theater Robert Houdin was occupied by the French army and was used as a hospital for injured soldiers. Most copies of Méliès' Star Film Company films were stored on site and were melted down by the French army in order to recover valuable silver. Ironically, the melted-down celluloid was also used to create heels for the boots of the soldiers. Despite his best efforts, it would seem Méliès was never quite able to escape the family business. Luckily, prints of some 200 of his films have survived to modern day. In 1988, some 92 years after its initial public debut, a copy of The House of the Devil was found among footage stored at the New Zealand Film Archive. The film can now be viewed online by anyone that wishes to seek it out. As it is in the public domain, a copy of The House of the Devil can be viewed on the transcript page for this episode at horridpodcast.com. After watching The House of the Devil, it is easy to see why Méliès is often credited as the father of special effects. The film shows off Méliès' technical prowess and is a showcase for one type of special effect in particular, the stop trick or substitution splice. The way that the stop trick works is film is cut and edited together, allowing props and actors to appear, vanish, and transform, 
all within the blink of an eye. The stop trick is thoroughly mined throughout the House of the Devil's three-minute runtime. A bat becomes a man, a cauldron appears from nothing, a woman appears from the cauldron, a skeleton appears from out of nowhere, a woman becomes a ghost, which then becomes a group of ghosts. It's, it's an incredible spectacle. I can only wonder how audiences reacted to seeing all of these impossible displays for the first time. For Melies, I imagine that watching those audience reactions must have been incredibly rewarding. Knowing that Melies was trained as a stage illusionist, it certainly makes for a good story to suppose that Melies saw the potential of using film to develop illusions that simply would not have been possible to perform on the live stage. However, Melies himself wrote in his memoirs that he discovered the stop trick by accident. In his own words, An obstruction of the apparatus that I used in the beginning a rudimentary apparatus in which the film would often tear or get stuck and refuse to advance, produced an unexpected effect. One day, when I was prosaically filming, I had to stop for a minute to free the film and to get the machine going again. During this time, passerby, omnibuses, cars, had all changed places, of course. When I later projected the film, reattached at the point of the rupture, I suddenly saw the Madeleine Bastille bus change into a hearse, and men changed into women. The trick by substitution, called the stop trick, had been invented, and two days later I performed the first metamorphosis of men into women, and the first sudden disappearances that had, at the beginning, such a great success. While Melies' explanation also makes for a great story, film scholar Jacques Deslandes supposes that even this admission of accidental discovery is likely an exaggeration. Deslandis suggests it is more likely that Méliès learned of the substitution trick by carefully examining The Execution of Mary Scott, a short film produced by Edison Studios in August of 1895. And yes, the Edison in Edison Studios does refer to the famous and controversial historical figure Thomas Edison. In addition to his other inventions, Edison was also deeply ingrained in the beginnings of the movie industry in the United States. The execution of Mary Scott depicts the beheading of the titular character through a shot that substitutes the actress for a mannequin. Even if this is true, Méliès is due credit for popularizing and perfecting the effect, as it was Méliès' careful attention to details like scene composition and actor placement which made his efforts so convincing and which set the gold standard for filmmakers to come. And there we have it, the dawn of horror in film. Before King Kong, before Dracula, there was a French stage magician with a mind for both machines and entertainment. Although the name Georges Méliès may not be as well known to the modern horror fan, his contributions are significant, and he deserves to be remembered along with the other luminaries of the genre. If you have the inclination, I would recommend watching some of Méliès' films for yourself, As mentioned, The House of the Devil can be viewed on the transcript page for this episode, which can be found online at horridpodcast.com. If you know any factual errors or have additional information related to this episode, please send an email to email at horridpodcast.com. You can also follow me on Twitter or Instagram at Doc Manson. If you've enjoyed this podcast, consider taking two minutes of your time to tell two of your friends about Horrid. If you'd like to hear more about the history of horror, be sure to subscribe to Horrid through your podcast app of choice. Until next time, stay scared. I'm Doc Manson from HorridPodcast.com.